Hi, welcome to our live show at Veterinary Referral Center of Central Oregon. I'm Jen Bentley, the dermatologist here at the hospital, and we are going to start talking about grain-free diets and the association with DCM or cardiomyopathy. Um, and so there's no special guest today, it is just me, and then we've also got Shelby um, in back on the camera and Denali taking your questions as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out talking about exactly what DCM is, kind of what the associations that we're seeing with DCM and grade free diets and the evidence that we have for that. And then I'll spend the last half of the show talking about how you can actually pick a good pet food um, for your dog or cat and some of the steps that we would recommend that goes into that. And it's definitely not what you're thinking, so stay tuned for that second half. But um, DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's dilated enlargement cardio of the heart myopathy disorder of the muscle. And you might think that having an enlarged heart is really good because it's gonna pump really well, but it's actually not. So it pumps less efficiently due to the enlargement of the muscles. And that can lead to arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. And it can also lead to heart failure. So it is a super, super serious disease. And there's multiple syndromes associated with DCM. So one of the syndromes that we have seen back way back in like the 1970s, 1980s had to deal with cats getting DCM. And cats were getting it because DCM is, was caused by them not having an essential amino acid called taurine in the diet. And we'll be talking about taurine a little bit later on because that comes into a plaque factor with the diets for dogs. Taurine is an essential amino acid, which means that cats can't make that themselves. They have to get it from the environment. So if they're not getting it from their food in this case, they can't make it and they're not gonna have it. And so back in the day, we were seeing a lot of cases with cats with this, finally figured it out and started supplementing taurine in the diet. And we really don't see this in cats anymore. The second syndrome of DCM has to do with its genetic influence on dogs. So genetics are causing DCM and this is kind of the, the boxers and Dobermans and Irish Wolfhounds are poster childs and it's a genetic issue in these guys. So what ended up sparking basically the FDA's involvement in all of this is we were starting to get a lot of cases, 560 cases of dilated cardiomyopathy and dogs that were actually not the breeds we expected it to be, not the Irish Wolfhounds, the Dobermans, not those breeds, but off breeds. It was Labradors, Golden Retrievers, even Whippets were on that list. Um, and so that sparked even a further investigation on why is this happening? And it turned out from that investigation that 90% of those dogs were actually being fed grain-free diets. It's important though to realize that correlation doesn't always equal causation. So a lot more research needs to go on in this because it was also noted that, well, grain-free diet two years ago was a big fad and perhaps the clientele that was bringing their dogs to the cardiologists at the universities were more likely to feed a grain-free diet than your average consumer. Um, so to follow this up, there's been several studies since then, and one of those studies was done at UC Davis, and it, it was rather small, it was 24 dogs. And of those 24 dogs, um, basically all of them were being fed grain-free diets and had dilated cardiomyopathy. And what they did with these patients was they actually switched the diets and then started supplementing with taurine, which was that essential amino acid we know play a part in cats, and these dogs got better. And the interesting thing is you can say, oh, well, taurine supplementation is good, but we know that dogs actually, it's not an essential amino acid for them, meaning that they can make it themselves. So it has a little bit more to do with taurine supplementation. And it probably has to do with some of the metabolism that's going on and the interaction between okay. ingredients. So one of the probably most prominent theories we have right now is that, um, so going back a step, grain-free implies no wheat, no corn, um, and also no ancient grains like quinoa. Um, and what the manufacturers have done is instead of putting those in the diet, they've put legumes. So like peas and, and lentils are going into these diets. And peas and lentils have certain enzymes in them, and those enzymes may be reacting with other ingredients that are precursors 
that are affecting how we are metabolizing things and making taurine potentially um, in our pets. So that, that's kind of the growing theory that's, that's not confirmed yet, but that's one of the leading theories on this association between grain-free and dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and that kind of goes into a whole other spectrum of why are we even feeding our diet dogs a grain-free diet. So this did not come from veterinary medicine. This did not come from a science or a journal article that was like, grain-free diets are great for dogs. This was certainly from marketing. Um, and so from my perspective as a, as, you know, a dermatologist where I deal with a lot of food allergies, um, I have seen dogs get better on grain-free diets. And I do believe the reason for that is grain-free also implies soy-free. And soy is a protein and it's a, it's a major allergen in dogs. Um, but it's also important to note that you don't have to feed a grain-free diet to feed a soy-free diet. So there's, there's lots of diets out there that could work for pets who happen to have this allergy. Um, so that's dilated cardiomyopathy in a nutshell with the grain-free diet. And I'm kind of gonna switch gears now um, and talk about uh, basically how to pick a diet in, in your pet. Um, so please chime in if you have any questions. It looks like we got one over there. So we have a comment and then a question. So Debbie said that it's very hard to find even a non-grain free food without peas. Um, and then Sandra said that my Cocker Spaniel Bentley transitioned from raw to dehydrated food with taurine sup supplements in it. Um, is there any evidence for any diet ingredients that help with the absorption of taurine? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and the fact of the matter is we don't know how these things are interacting together. So that's still under investigation. So right now I can't look at an ingredient list and be like, this food is okay. And I, I think that brings us into kind of the next phase is, well, what should you look on the labels? And what should you look on that bag of food? To, to have the best chance that this is not going to be a problem from your pet. I also think we should put this in perspective as well. So it was 560 dogs in the beginning that they noted this in. It's been about 1,500 now that have been reported. There's 77 million dogs out there. So it was not a large amount of pets getting this. And I don't want to downplay the seriousness of the disease, um, but there, it's a multifactorial problem. So it's not just the, the grain-free diets. It also has to do with the genetics of the dog and potentially even disease factors as well. Like something like hypothyroidism can affect metabolism too. So there might be different causes even for different dogs and reasons of why these things are interacting causing changes. Um, picking, picking your dog food or your cat food. So a lot of people, the first thing they're gonna look at is the ingredient list and I, I love there's this quote from a nutritionist and she's like, pets don't need ingredients, they, they need nutrients. Um, and so I think the ingredient list is probably the last place you should actually look to determine if you are feeding a good dog or cat food. And the reason for that is the ingredient list is a huge promotional piece by these manufacturers. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how the ingredient list gets manipulated. So one thing is, you know, you might look at something and it's first on that ingredient list. That's great, but it's by weight. So if something has a lot of water content, it's gonna go to the top of the ingredient list and it may not be a substantial amount of that food. The second way they play with this ingredient list is actually wordage and verbiage. Verbiage that you like to hear. So everyone wants to hear organic, holistic, and human grade. Unfortunately, those types of words have absolutely no meaning. And the reason why is they're not regulated. So there's not a food I can say, is this organic or not? What are the terms to be organic? That doesn't exist. The only regulation term we have is natural. So if you're picking a dog food because it says holistic on it, it's not a good reason to pick a, pick a dog food. The third thing the manufacturers do is they add ingredients that we think are great um, for us, um, but aren't so great for our animals. So I've even seen toxic ingredients in foods like garlic. Um, and then sometimes they'll put in things that we know don't even work and work for our animals. So for example, flaxseed oil is added to 
some of these foods. Well, cats can't even get the right omegas out of flaxseed oil. They don't have the enzyme for it. And dogs, um, they have partially, but it's definitely not the best choice to be adding as an omega supplement. Um, so they really do play around with this because they know what people want to hear. The other big thing too um, I'll mention is the idea of byproducts being, being bad. Um, and the truth of the matter is um, we all think of byproducts as like, oh yeah, that's something we don't want to put in our foods. But actually byproducts can contain a whole lot of nutrients. So kidney um, is a byproduct. All of the organs are byproducts. And guess what? Those have a really, really good source of taurine in them. And so we've taken those out to make it sound more appealing to, to, to us, to the consumers. Um, and I'm not saying you don't need to go out there and, and not have and pick foods with byproducts in it. If you really don't want to, that's fine. But the reason that there's a set of guidelines that we use um, that we tell owners to basically pick our dog and cat food. So, and I'm not going to go over them um, all, but I'll share a couple of them with you and we'll post them to Facebook as well. So um, the Global Nutrition Committee, um, experts in the field have basically come up with these. They're not my, from myself. Um, they're really uh, guidelines that, that a lot of people are using. And so one of the first ones is to look for the AFCO statement on the dog or cat food. Um, I would not feed a pet or recommend a product that doesn't have an AFCO statement. That is how you're going to know it's actually nutritionally sound and balanced. And what you should be looking for on that AFCO statement is that feeding trials have, be have been done. Um, and it's not just nutritionally sound by the formulation. It's nice if it looks good on paper, that's great, but if you actually have proof that it's working well in the animals, that's actually much better. The second thing I always look for in dog food um, and cat food is, does the company have the right people on the staff? And so it's a little bit of research you have to do. And what you're looking for is a PhD in animal science or um, a veterinary nutritionist. Um, so they're going to be members of the American Veterinary Nutrition Academy or the European. Um, so if they don't have those credentials, you really shouldn't be having them formulate your, your pet food. Okay. Got another question? Yes. Debbie would like to know what kind of statement? Kind of statement? So there's basically like three statements they make and I don't know those off the top of my head head right now, um, but it's basically um, nutritionally sound for all life stages using feeding trials is what you would look at. Um, and again, we'll, we'll post the actual verbiage up there and all of these guidelines to make sure um, that um, you're clear on exactly what you need to look for. Yeah. I think that's about it. I could talk about this subject um, all day long, uh, but I, I definitely wanted to just give you those kind of pieces of information that I think Really, you know, we try so hard to feed the right things to our pets and, you know, the unfortunately is the manufacturers know that and they're really trying to appeal to us and trying to appeal to this idea of wellness and organic. Um, but those are, those are great terms to use, but at the end of the day, it just has to be a good food that's providing the right nutrients um, and that you know that. So um, check out those list of eight things that we'll post from the Global Nutrition um, community and we'll get those up and if you have any other questions I know it's kind of a broad topic um, feel free to chime in after the show and I'll be happy to answer them as best as possible